Thank you everyone for joining me for another episode of the Bench Podcast. I am here uh, graced with Carlin's presence today. I'd like to welcome Carlin Coster to the podcast. He is a realtor at Century 21 Bamber Realty in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, please go follow him. His full bio will be in the description for the podcast, but his Instagram handle is Carlin the Re- at Carlin the Realtor. Super simple. <laughs> uh, welcome to the podcast, Carlin. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's good to be uh, joining and talking about one of my favorite things. Oh, yeah. Well, we're talking about open houses today. Um, I'm also very curious to start this conversation. If you're not a realtor and you're listening to this podcast, open houses are very controversial in the real estate world right now. Um, It's do them, don't do them. Who's it for? What's the purpose? So what's, what's the purpose of an open house, in your opinion? So the, the ultimate opinion of mine is that an open house is a way to market the property. Okay. At the end of at the end of the day, I always tell my clients, you know what, the open house may or may not sell the open the, the property, but what it does is that it gives somebody else the opportunity to touch their social channels, their social circle, and put out additional marketing to the world. Now, in some cases, they're not going to be required, but in some times when you have a slower market or a more unique property, I look at that as it's another avenue to get somebody in to see your home. And when a house is on the market and for sale, the objection, or sorry, the what I look to have happen is that we want everyone to know it's available. You know, objections happen, sure, but like the, the objective <laughs> is that everybody knows it's available and everyone gets a chance to see it. Yes, exactly. So I guess the devil's advocate to that is are our open houses just for the neighbors is it just for realtors to pick up other buyers um is it safe secure I, I think there's a lot of kind of downsides that people perceive as you know is it worth my while I don't know if it's realtors who are really saying that or if it's the public like I don't, I don't really know where that opinion came from but w- what's your what, what would you say to those people <laughs> Well, I think at the end of the day, and I, I'm not sure all the, the different logistical things that you've got to take care of in your market versus ours, but at the end of the day, lawful instruction is what matters. So mm-hmm. if here in Alberta, where I practice, if our sellers say, I do not want you to have an open house, simple, there's no open houses, you know, and that could be a matter of whether they're, they're private people or whether they have certain things in the home they don't want being taken care of. I know during COVID, it was very uh, difficult to navigate all those different challenges that it came along with. So at the end of the day, it comes down to what the seller wants to happen. If they say, do the open house, the open house gets done. You know, I, I think that a lot of realtors object to being put in a, a box, <laughs> a house or a condo, whatever it's going to be, <laughs> and sitting there for two hours because if they're busy, they could be doing a lot of things during that time period. And if it's not going to result in their ultimate goal of selling that house for their client, it might not be the best use of their time. You know, okay. on the other side of that, it comes down to you as an agent, what what do you want to see happen there? And I'll be frank, my very first couple of years, I did a lot of open houses because I was in a city that I didn't grow up in. I didn't have a huge circle here. How do I meet people? How do I get to know areas more intimately? You know, and I spent a lot of time and I met a lot of clients in open houses. You know, as as an agent, I think open houses are one of the best things you can do to meet new clients. And it might they might want that house, they may not want that house. But going in with the understanding that you might meet new clients, you might sell this house, but you're still getting marketing to that property, I think it's a win-win in my mind. Absolutely. I think every type of marketing for a listing could potentially be skewed as, oh, you're just trying to get other clients. But if you're advertising a property, you're meeting buyers, like in, in one way or another, if it's on Facebook or if it's an open house or whatever, buyers are contacting you, whether it's for that property or not, the potential is that they're interested in that one. (laughs) Um, Yeah. They, you might get a sign call, which for those that are not realtors means that somebody sees your listing on realtor.ca and sees your phone number and just calls you and says, I want to look at this property. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, And I like your point that the open house, the purpose is to sell that house because, and I, I, maybe I revert to this story too often, but it's just, it's just perfect. The situation that happened. So I had a property, it had been on the market for three weeks. Um, and I was advertising an open house for the following weekend. And somebody had asked a question on a Facebook ad. And so I responded to their question and I said, just so you know, we're doing an open house this weekend. Um, they never responded. Who knows? I was just, you know, trying to market it. They came to the open house um, and then nothing happened for another week. And then they messaged me again. Hey, I just had this one question about the house um, and they ended up buying it. They they weren't even looking for a house, but they saw the, I mean, I guess it's twofold. They saw the ad on Facebook, but 
would they have booked an appointment with me? It's highly intimidating. They weren't looking for a house. I find open houses are a little bit softer of a, mm -hmm. of an opening, you know, not everybody who buys is intentionally looking for a house. Sure. Yeah. So I, it was, it was perfect. And now I tell that story every time somebody says, Oh, open houses don't work. I'm like, well, actually <laughs> they do. You know and I agree a hundred percent. And I'll give you two examples that will further bolster that position. You yeah. know, I've got a, a property on the market right now that we're expecting an offer. I haven't got it quite yet, but here's the funny part about it. I had an open house last weekend on this condo and there were 16 groups through during the open house of those 16 groups, four of them had been through with their realtors in the past week. And their realtors said, they're probably going to come and have a look. They're still interested, but of the four of them, three had to sell their house first, which hasn't sold yet. So they're waiting to write an offer because they're really interested. But at the same time, they were all in the house at the same time. And I, I got, I was able to almost position that and let them know because we were all talking. I said, oh, they were here as well with their realtor. And I made sure that each one of them knew that they were all interested because that's yeah. additional motivation for them to say, well, uh oh, like there's maybe the risk I'm going to lose this house. So for me, serving my sellers, I'm in there generating more appeal and more potential that they're going to sell for a higher amount of money. Yeah. You know, that's my first story. My second story is I had a really cool townhouse that I sold earlier last summer and my sellers were so cool. She was a sustainability engineer and he was a mason. So they had put so much work into this townhouse, but it was all from their hands. But in a way that you, it wasn't do it yourself. It, it was professionally done, but mm -hmm. they had sustainably sourced all of their materials from the crystal door handles to, they'd had this really cool brick wall they had done, but the brick had all come off of a school that had been built a hundred years ago and had sat in someone's basement for, I think it was about 20 years. And then the guy got divorced, reached out to the, the mason and said, Hey, I know that you want all these bricks. I have them now. So they took them and they made this wall and they did a couple other things that were really, really cool. Well, I had an open house on the first weekend and it was quite busy but the last couple that came in brought some of their friends and I knew that intimate knowledge and could speak to the the story and how it was created so they started to get their eyes buggy and turns out they're historians ah. that worked at, at, at a local uh college university whatever it was they got so excited they left called their agent came back an hour later and they bought the house ah. had had I not been there to explain to them how this all worked and the fact that this shelf up in the kitchen had been part of the biscuit block building downtown that was reclaimed and and they walked through all those intimate pieces of why that house was specific and unique it okay. wouldn't have probably sold that very first day to those very first clients who paid a premium for it so i think those are two great examples of why you would want to do an open house for your sellers oh yeah i love that story actually mm -hmm. and that's exactly the next point i was going to make we it's such a unique opportunity because we as realtors rarely get the chance to interact with buyers and so we rarely get the chance to communicate things like there's realtors who will put up signs during showings like fyi fridge replaced this year or you know whatever just to try and get the message across sure. but you rarely get the chance to actually be like this property is freaking cool and yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> like, this is why you should buy it i would buy this house if i was buying a house you know what i mean yeah um, so well, yeah. in my mind, no one should know the house better than the listing agent yeah. because they need to go through, walk through all those pieces from the seller. And sometimes the seller is not going to remember or understand why things are critical or important. In a lot of cases they will, but not every seller is going to be that astute. So it's our job and our, our duty, I think, to understand all of those different characteristics and be able to explain them, especially when you have that opportunity to put them in front of a buyer. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you can do your best to try and communicate that to the buyer's agent. And like I said, notes, paperwork, that kind of stuff for showings available. And some people will go through it and some people won't. And so mm -hmm. it's just, I, I always encourage even my buyers, you know, we see, we see a house and then there's an open house the subsequent, subsequent weekend, or there is one on the weekend and we're seeing it on Monday, go check it out because you don't know you really don't know what information you're missing sure. until you communicate with that person. And then either you find out more information that's highly valuable or sometimes not. <laughs> well, <laughs> and <laughs> you make a really great point. Like I, I will tell my buyers the same thing and I'll often offer to accompany them. Yes. As we know, some of our buyers feel bad about that and they say, you know what, I'll just go check it out and I'll be out getting groceries, doing whatever. Sometimes you got somebody in that open house that's telling a lot of things they maybe shouldn't. Whether yeah. it be a neighbor, whether you have a, I've, I've unfortunately had sellers stick around and I'm like, Shh, don't say anything that could give away your motivation. But sometimes yeah. those, those things happen too. So on the buying side, they can be highly influential to the deal that you're going to get. 
Totally. And, and like you said, not only for a sales tactic, but you really can gauge how many people are interested in the house. Like sometimes, yeah. sometimes it's tons of people and it's like, okay, I really got to get my shit together or yeah. side, nobody's at the open house. The realtor looks bored. They're on their phone. Okay. Maybe we have a real chance here, especially sure. last year. It was like, if, there, if nobody was at the open house, you may have a chance to buy that. House. <laughs> I'm thinking, wait, you, you had time to do open houses last year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, fair enough. <laughs> I, I, the interesting thing is I don't know if I even saw any open house signs for about three and a half months because literally nothing was happening. The only time that I saw open houses is when I would do them on properties that were, I knew were going to be really crazy that we were holding offers on. And I would book at least an hour for an open house just so that if it filled up on appointments, there was an opening where people could get in to do that. So I would strategically pick that hour or an hour and a half to make sure that those that couldn't get into appointments had a space to go to. Yes, be especially because, I mean, pre-COVID, we could overlap showings. And so it was kind of like, mm -hmm. yep, you know, sh things are available, come on in. But during COVID, we weren't able to overlap appointments. And so that's a good point. We at, we were also taking the opposite, um, you know, not booking open houses because we didn't want to book up that time for potential people, you know, to mm -hmm. view it. Um, but yeah, either way, um, I'm happy that they're back. I think like- yes. We've seen quite a few, even it's only January right now at the time that we're recording this. And we've seen mm -hmm. quite a few in Winnipeg so far this year. So people are getting back out there. Um, and realtors, I think, are realizing that you need to start marketing properties again. <laughs> you can't well, just like throw up a sign. It's true. But here's, here's a different take on that. Yeah. So I, as when I'm a buyer's agent, I'm, I'm pretty non-bullshit. I'm pretty open-minded about everything, yeah. but I'm myself all the time. I'm, I'm very transparent in who I am and I'm very authentic in who I am. And some like it and some don't. Yeah. I look at a, an open house as a job interview. If, if yeah. I'm there, I'm also, yes, marketing the house, doing that. But every person that comes in, that house may not be for them. And that's a reality. You can't just try and sell every house to every person because that's, poor salesman a i think it's outside of the fiduciary duties of working with a buyer if you're like well let's buy this house no is it the right house for them if not then it's not the right house and that's okay you know because what do they need what are their, their wish list what's the deal breakers you can't just try and force a house down someone's throat if it's not going to work then you have that commission breath and that that stank that people think that we have and yeah. there's so many good realtors that aren't that that we, we know how it goes you know like the, yeah. the the way people sometimes view lawyers, car salesmen, realtors, that, that follows us sometimes. And yeah. it's a valid point because there are some people in every industry that don't do things uh, with, with good intention or good nature. And that's that's every industry. And we are not remiss to say that that happens in our industry too. But yeah. there are the bulk of us that really care about our clients, about our, our industry, our, our communities. We are the stewards of our communities in many cases. So yeah. when we go in there and we recognize that, hey, you know what, in, in the case of that house I talked about, that buyer, that was the perfect house for them yeah. from all of the stories of, that they heard about it that were true and that were not fabrication, but aligned with what things were important to them in yeah. a community that was close to where they worked. It was the perfect fit for what they were looking for. Yeah. That's a great example. You know, for the, uh, the rest of people in that house that were there that day that didn't buy it, they had a good experience. We chit chatted, we hung out, but it wasn't for them. So they didn't come back and consider it. So yeah. if somebody walks into a house and says, I'm looking for these five things and that house doesn't offer them, they're probably just going to have a look-see and then leave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think there is this, um, it's very interesting, in my opinion, to, to host an open house because, and fair enough, I think it, that reputation has a lot to do with it. People come in on guard. They're like, do not try to sell me this house. Yeah. Do not. I'm not buying this house. I'm just looking. Yeah. And, and I think because a lot of people come on too strong, they have, you know, it's tactics to try and get their information to contact. Fine. Free but, bottle of wine. If you leave all of your information, we'll do a draw for this $12 bottle of Costco wine. Exactly. Like <laughs> great tactic, but it's so transparent. Just say, like, just say what you're, what you're, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, that like, it's not somebody's fault. And as we know, even for showings, you don't know if you're going to like a property until you see it in person. I mean, some things you can Absolutely. tell, but these people are just seeing this house in person mm -hmm. for the first time. And absolutely, it might, like you said, it might not work. It's not, it's not offensive. A, it's not our house. It's not offensive. It shouldn't be offensive, right? If they don't, no. the house that you're in, 
it that's fine it's objective unless maybe you flipped it <laughs> exactly and you're the one selling it <laughs> exactly kidding. yeah but I think there is that like I mean we represent the house I take a lot of pride in the houses that I do represent but if it's not for somebody I'm not mm-hmm. gonna you know be offended but I think there is that feeling that like you're trying to sell that house yeah trying to, I don't know be on be on that side well here's what I'll take is that if the feedback that they give you that's constructive is things that you could have done differently, right. then maybe you will feel a little bit em- embarrassed that as a professional, you didn't do the thing that maybe was going to make the house be the best. And let's be frank, we've all made mistakes in our career because it's how we learn and how we grow. You know, right. But if someone comes in and says, oh, I hate this, the way the staircase moves or this way, or the positioning is, yeah. well, you, you can't do anything about that. So really, like, I know when I talk to my clients that were selling their houses, I say, here's the feedback that I think we're going to get that's great, and that is constructive. So I want you to hear it from me first, so when you hear it from open houses or clients or buyers or what have you, you're not surprised. You shouldn't be, in my mind, as, as one of my sellers, surprised at what you hear for feedback. Yeah. You know? And if you do the right steps to prepare the house, you're only going to get feedback on things that you can't change for that the most part. Yeah, exactly. And it, I think that's that's the best kind of feedback because that means yeah. the house just wasn't for them. Like you 100%. said, it's out of your out of your control. Um, OK, so we've pumped up open houses for a little bit. Do you have any cringy open house stories? Because, I mean, it is it's a public event. Anybody can come in. Um, do you have any cringy stories about things that have happened that that weren't, you know, Amazing. <laughs> two. There's, okay. there's literally only two that stand out in my mind that I can think about where it was uncomfortable. Okay. And I come from a, a different place of, of privilege when I do open houses because I'm I'm six foot tall. I'm a man. I'm I'm, I'm strong. <laughs> you know, but I, so I don't, I don't get the creeps that come in because unfortunately there are the people that will go to open house and they will make it very uncomfortable for a, a woman like yourself or a, a smaller man or someone of, of color like that don't feel comfortable in those spaces so I recognize that and I know that when I go to those spaces it's a different experience for me okay. however that doesn't mean that you're not going to have something that happens that makes you feel really uncomfortable and yeah. there's the most uncomfortable one that I had was after a work event the night before so I had had a couple cocktails with my boss and my broker and all those different pieces so I was a little bit hungover and um it happens I still was like I have my own house I got to go to it and it was my my uh, CEO was listening at the time and I get there and it was a, a fourplex in the community that I live in. So I know it very well. And I had done open houses in that complex when it was a uh, brand new development versus being resale where it was now four years later. So I knew it pretty well. So I show up to this uh, property and to my understanding, it's going to be nobody there. And as you kind of mentioned with my Instagram being very basic, Carlin, the realtor, yes. I always, I use that because it's, it's my identifier when I walk into a house. My, if I walk into a showing or into an open house or anything that I'm doing, hey, it's Carl and the realtor coming in. Anybody here? Because you just never know. Yeah. And so I walked into this open or this open house that I was going to have, and I'm about like probably 15 minutes away from starting. So I'm just going to go in, get my lights on, familiarize myself with the space, not my listing, so I don't know it intimately. And I didn't hear anything, so I'm walking around, turning on lights, looking at this, checking these things out, kind of regretting the fact that I'm there at this moment because I wish I was at home in bed. But you know what? I'm a big boy. I'm here. <laughs> and as I'm going up, it's a, a, like a, a four st- or a three story with a basement. So I get done the basement in the, the first story and I go to go to the second floor and it was two bedrooms and then a master up on the top. And I thought I heard something. So I was kind of like, hello. Yeah. And I like peek around into one of the bedrooms and there's this, we'll call him a dude bro because it, it's the best way to explain. He's laying there on the bed in his underwear with a big headset on playing some kind of video games. And I'm kind of taken aback because... I didn't expect this and yeah. I have an open house starting in a few moments yeah and so I kind of was like I, I froze and he pops his ear off he's like you're here for the open house yeah oh. I, I I'm here to facilitate that I said okay cool have fun and puts his, his headphone back on oh my god <laughs> so I'm like you're gonna stay here this whole time like he wasn't an attractive person but that makes it very awkward <laughs> so I thought maybe he would leave if I just kind of started fussing around and doing my thing so I get the other house or other bedroom turned on go upstairs and I come back downstairs and then I went and I called my CEO and said listen like there's I I think a tenant here I don't think he's the owner Uh, he's he's sitting in his bedroom in his underwear playing video games it's kind of uncomfortable like do they know that I'm supposed to be here like what expectations were set because it's kind of awkward and uh he said well he's they're supposed to be gone 
well, they're, they're not, they're here. And yeah. so I, I, I asked him, I went upstairs and said, would, would you mind, it's just an hour and a half that I'm here. Would you mind maybe going somewhere else and maybe grabbing a coffee just so I can make sure that I can showcase the property? Yeah. He's like, no, I'm good. So <laughs> in the state of mind that I was in, I was not ready for this kind of moment to this impact. So I just kind of like slammed the door and was like, I'm back downstairs. And then, so then as people would walk into the open house, I'd have to say, oh, by the way, the, the second bedroom on the main or, the, or on the second floor with the door closed, please don't go in there because somebody's inside. And it was super awkward because I couldn't explain like there's some guy probably feeling just as bad as I feel because he's probably hung over. He just yeah. wants to play on his bed. And like, to his credit, like, He's like, I don't care. Like, you want to come and have a look? Have a look. But okay, it was really okay. uncomfortable to facilitate that. And then about 25 minutes before the open house closed, he got up and left. Oh my and God. And all I could think about was, why didn't you leave an hour ago? Because this is so awkward. So exactly. that was the first one. The second one was I was selling a house uh, just across my house over here. And one of the neighbors came in and it was a very busy open house. So when I have a busy open house, I try and just float through and, and facilitate and ask questions. And if somebody's interested, and, and I think, again, it's our job to determine who maybe is a viable buyer and to weed through the noise of who's there just to, to look and who's interested. And if someone's really interested and they want to know more about that property, you've got to zero in on them and give them your attention because at the end of the day, your job, if you are there, is to sell that house. That yeah. is the focus while you're there. So yeah. this had happened to me and I was identified and actually it was the person who bought the house ironically uh he had come through we were having a conversation and then this gal came in behind him and she had her house on the market about a block over with somebody else and her house wasn't selling and she didn't have an open house happening and i did and mine was full of people so yeah. she's in there and kind of poking around and anyway that the buyer that ended up buying it he goes through and he's up on the back deck and he's calling his family and doing all these different pieces and she's trying to give me the the ride act about why her house isn't selling and mine's priced so much higher and blah 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 blah, blah and all these things and i said are, are you here because you're interested in the house or because you're pissed off at your representation exactly and she's like well this house is not better than mine and, she, and i said i'm going to ask you to leave because you know what you don't have a business being here today yeah. You know, you're not interested. You're, you're being nosy and you're being frankly quite rude. And yeah. I don't have time for this. So there's the door. You can leave it. And if you don't want to leave, I know your agent. I'm going to call them and I'm going to ask them to come and get you because <laughs> you are now literally, and I, I was not playing around with this chick because don't get your here, <laughs> it's, it's, it's my listing. It's the first day that we're on the open house market for the weekend. And my job is to sell that house and make sure that it looks good. And I got some lady from down the street in here trying to sideline that for me. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I fight for my clients and I would have thrown her ass out if I had to. Like, <laughs> yeah, I love that. <laughs> I will Listen, hundred percent. I another. This is not an open house story, but it is very close to that. Really in our market last year, it was very difficult to get into certain houses and certain price points. And my clients were helping their their mom and dad move here, and it's about the whole fight for my client situation. We had the very first showing booked for when they started showing. It was one o'clock on a Friday. We were the first one. I had guaranteed we were the first one. So I'm sitting outside waiting, and my clients that are coming to look for their parents she's nine months pregnant so oh. like i i pull up and there's people in the driveway and i know from the, the seller's agent that i'm the first showing there's no one before me they didn't start showing till one o'clock and i see this couple and their agent kind of walking around so i was like this is very interesting mm -hmm. so i get out i was going to go over and ask them what they're doing and then my clients pull up and get out because we're a time for an appointment and i'm over when they're when they pulled up i'm at the front door talking to the agent and his clients he's like oh well we're at two o'clock okay, great. Well, we're at one o'clock. So I would like you to leave, please. Because yeah. we our time. He's like, well, can we just come at the same time? No, no. And I look over and my client is now nine months pregnant in January, walking down the street from where she had to park because she couldn't park in the driveway because both <laughs> the agent and the other people were parked there. Oh, so I, I, I turned and said, if my client falls because you're here early and in our window, I'm going to be so mad at you. And yeah. I said, so you can just get in your cars and leave. And I probably said it a little bit more meter because I was not happy with how they were both those buyers and that agent were trying to like take over my client's stuff. Yeah. So then we, we were done in about 15 minutes and we saved the full hour. So I was yeah. like, you know what? We're going to keep walking around and we're just going to make sure that we take yeah. all of our time. And yeah. while we were in there, they decided to buy the house. So the best revenge is that we did a bully offer and got the house <laughs> ahead of presentation time on the Sunday. And like they had to pay over asking because that was the market, but they yeah. actually paid less than they would have paid if they waited until Sunday because they canceled 45 showings. Uh, after we had the offer accepted the first day. So I joked to my clients that the best revenge on that guy was that we bought the house and they couldn't. So exactly. but again, I was like, get out of here. <laughs> my I, clients. Like, <laughs> it was very like, um, it was very catty out there. Like 2020 and 2021, I just feel like, it, like sh our showing times were limited to 30 minutes. And it, 30 minutes. Some were doing 15. Yeah, exactly. And it, yeah, what we were in yeah. there 
you're waiting outside and if somebody's like one minute over your your 15 minute window it's like ah like get out yeah uh, yeah no. I uh on the well, open that happens <laughs> yeah I know and like yeah you have to represent your clients and the best way to represent them is give them the appropriate amount of time to view a house before yeah offering on it like it's so crazy 15 minutes in in a house and you decide whether you want to buy it or not like you have to have the full 15 at the very least yeah uh I had an interesting so it was I mean it was an open house but it was a showing uh or sorry a show home um so not like a resale open house it was it was sure. Saturday but this weekend happened to be uh I'm going to mess this up. Grey Cup, Super Bowl, I don't know, football weekend. And so there was tons of people coming through and then the game started at whatever, two o'clock. And I just assumed it would slow down because people are at home watching the game. Um, so this group comes in, uh, this guy sits down on the couch. I had the game on because obviously, and I, there's a group of ladies. So I just assumed like, okay, he's, he's not interested in this. He just wants to whatever, let them check out the house. And then, sure. so the ladies check out the house. I'm just leaving him to watch his football. I'm not chatting with him because whatever, he's not interested. Then the ladies leave. And he's still there. <laughs> he's still there. And this is two. And the show home was, I think, one to five. Um, so at some point I just went over and I was like, I don't know, like, if you know, but your group left. And he was like, what group? So <laughs> he proceeded to stay and watch, I guess, a free version of this of the football game until five, until I was close. And I literally had to, I went upstairs, started shutting lights off. Like doing the, the last call, like the bar moves. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> last call. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. <laughs> Semi saw at closing time. Yeah, oh, exactly. It. It the was... only way that story can get better is if he bought the house. Exactly. I know. I was like, and, and sometimes with show homes, because the possessions are so delayed, I was questioning myself. I was like, is he like, did he buy this house? And he's just like wait, waiting for possession and enjoying it in the meantime. There's you know, a lease back. He's already bought all the furniture too. He's like, this is my house. He's like, eventually it'll be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, come on <laughs> in, but like, I'll be here. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, and it like, thankfully, I mean, it was uncomfortable, but I didn't feel unsafe. It was just like hilarious. He was not a threatening type of person, just a, sure. just an interesting individual, I guess. But you know, if uh, if you don't have cable, <laughs> maybe that's the best way to do it. I don't know. Ingenuity, that's finest, right? Find what you yeah. need. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also to your to your three story home point, I think these two and a half to three story homes are the most interesting to show slash do open houses at because I have a very similar story. I was uh, doing a showing and I was early and then my clients ended up being late. So I was in the house 15 minutes before and they were 15 minutes late. So half an hour by myself. And I'm, you know, getting the lights on and reviewing the listing information. I'm kind of just I mean, I spent a lot of time in the basement because you never know, like in, in Winnipeg, two and a half story homes are, are older homes. So it's like, I just wanted to see, you know, is it worth them even coming? Mm. And sure. uh, so I'm in there for literally half an hour. Then I'm like, okay, done in the basement. I'll go upstairs and turn those lights on because, you know, we're still sure. in yeah. story lights on. Um, and I don't venture up into the two and a half, like the half story at the top because I kind of thought I saw, saw my client. So I go back down the stairs and I'm sure. waiting at the front door. I turn around and somebody's coming down the stairs. <laughs> they were just casually working in the office on the top floor, had no idea we were coexisting in this house for half an hour <laughs> and, and had no idea about the showing, had no idea anything was happening. Thankfully, he was fully clothed slightly different from your experience <laughs> but yeah I think like communication is is tough and like you said setting yeah. expectations because it does for showings and for open houses it like who knows what what people thought when they attended the open house that you hosted and somebody was sure. there the fact that you couldn't open a door and see the room um gives gives somebody an uneasy feeling and then yeah it's a red flag yeah. And then that's the, the story or the, you know, what, what goes on in their minds when they think about that house. It's like, oh yeah, was that the house where that guy was 
still there. Every house gets one characteristic that it gets remembered by. Remember yeah. this house or this house? And I'm sure you have all the stories in the world of that where it's like the buyer goes, oh, that was the, the creepy guy behind the door house or like that was the cat piss house or oh, that was the house that or, you know, that becomes that, that experience. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And like, yeah, if it's a negative, then there's no getting rid of that. That's it. Like that's, no. that's you're, it's done at that point. <laughs> I, I tell my sellers a couple of different things and I, I have like my kind of like, I'm sure you have them too. Your three to five things that you are like known for saying that you just they just fit into your business so well. You yeah. referenced one of mine earlier. You said that it's not our house. I tell all of my clients it's not my house and it's not my money. Yeah. So it's your decision. It is what it is. But yeah. I tell my sellers that it's about more of the, the narrative and the story. And we are creating the story for the buyers. We want them to see what we want them to see. We want to grab them by the, the neck when they walk in the front door and drag them through the house as we want to see it. You yes. know, and yeah. we want them to see all the good things about the house, but also we don't want to hide the bad things because we want them to see what it is. You know, people hate surprises that are not good surprises, you know, so whether you've got things fixed or whether you've identified them, they walk through the house and you're like, here's the offering. Here's why you're going to want it. And if you do that in the right way, people go, I see it. Yes. Nothing makes a buyer more mad than when they walk into a house and they go, you lied to me about why I'm here. Exactly. Exactly. Sell, sell that house. Yeah. And that, I think that's important during open houses too, because it's tough. Um, and I understand it's, it's public and there's lots of people there to talk to and you don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, but on the other hand, you still have to be honest. You still have to be authentic. If somebody points out a deficiency with the home, mm -hmm. yes, like, yep. That's Absolutely. Great. And then explain it. I mean, be knowledgeable about it, but, um, don't don't try to sugarcoat it because it's, mm -hmm. it's very transparent and it's you know they're seeing what you're seeing it there's no covering it up at this point like they're in it we're an open house today yeah. hello everybody come on and this is the house for you <laughs> exactly. yeah like like it's too late so just own it and like represent yeah. it and hopefully um yeah like hopefully they like it but maybe they're not comfortable with that particular sure. thing whatever uh, what i would say is some of the best experiences that I've had in open houses that have either be, become the seller of that or the buyer of that house or become a client of mine is because of those experiences, you know, and it's like, okay, well, let's talk about it. You know, if there is an objection about the house that's rectifiable, walk through that discussion of, well, how would, how would you redo this? You know, if you were going to change that, what would you do? You know, and get into that because people love to be on HGTV. Like they, people think that we just like live this HGTV fantasy. It's not the case. It's more like contracts and on our computers, but yeah. People love to, to see that and be part of that. So if they're in a house and they say, oh, well, I don't love this pink color or I don't love this layout. If there's a way to make it right and to rectify it that fixes the house and maybe the seller's not willing to do it, but somebody else is, explore that. You know, I had had a, a listing a couple of years ago and she's become one of my dearest friends and clients since then. And there had been, I was the third agent to try and sell this house when I first met her. And it was this they, they laugh at me now because I, they their whole family always has green in their houses. And then I went and did this in my office and they all think it's hilarious because I always tell them to paint their houses when they're green. <laughs> so they, they think this is the funniest thing in the world. But anyways, I had told them like, I think you should paint the house. And she's like, I, we spent so much money in this house. I'm not putting any more money into it. Like it's just, it is the way that it is. Yeah. But that conversation piece within that, that open house that I would do there, it was, it was the first thing. And people, you can't say, oh, well, this color is beautiful because most people didn't love the color. Yeah. So when they would walk in and they would say, oh, I acknowledge that. Hey, you know what? The client did paint this color. You know, yep. the reason why they did it is, and I would explain to them why that color made sense, because the developer that had made that whole neighborhood had done really, really dark, dark, dark grays. Yeah. So white wouldn't cover it without going four or five coats, which was like a $30,000 paint job. Yeah. So they had gone with a, a, a muted green color in their house that made this a two coat versus a five coat because yeah. they were being more responsible with their, with their finances, you yeah. know, and if you had explained that to some of the buyers, they might've said, oh, that makes more sense. So yeah. then by proxy, the paint coat that they're gonna have to do to cover that, that's a light color already, it's probably gonna be two coats versus it had been five coats if they hadn't have painted it. So exactly. yeah. walking and through that, yeah. And explaining that objection and also discussing kind of why it is can be really beneficial too, because people can't see past color. I know I've got many buyers walk in and go, oh, or I know people open house, they walk in and go, oh, okay. Sure. So then if you walk through that conversation or ask them, well, what color would you paint? What would you do? And you open up that dialogue, you might get good things that you didn't think about that can actually benefit you with other people in the future. Or if you're not the listing agent of that property, 
you're getting to see it from a different perspective where if that, that agent comes to you and says, well, how did it go? What feedback did you get? Yeah. You can give them feedback that maybe they didn't think about. So Absolutely. at the end of the day, that feedback is all a gift and we just take it and we just provide it as necessary. Absolutely. And I, I honestly love the, what you said about the vis- visualization of it, because you're right. Like in, in a buyer's mind, even in my mind, when I walk into a house and it's like a, a color that I don't love, it's work. That's the first thing you're thinking. You're like, oh, this house needs work. Um, but when you get into the visualization of, well, what color would you do it? Then all of a sudden it's not work. You're making it your own. It's like, oh, this is fun. This is, yeah. oh, if I could pick anything in the world, I can, you know what I mean? And then it's like, finally, um, it's a positive that like you get to change it. You don't have to live with whatever, maybe it's, it's beige, but you wouldn't have picked that beige, but it's livable. No, you get to sure. really make it your, your own and then you move into your house, not somebody else's house in paint colors. Yeah. Well, and here's the other piece about it as well. I, I tell a lot of my buyers and people that open houses, don't get fooled by shiny things. Sometimes it has been painted or whatever has happened, but it's been done in a horrible way. You know, I would I would much prefer good bones, well-maintained. You can make it your own if you want to because you can do that versus paying for somebody else's sloppy choices because they want to get ready for the market. Yes. I don't know how many houses I've been into where they go, oh, I, I want to sell. So look, we painted and I redid one one of the three bathrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, why? Because now you've got a discombobulated house that doesn't match, right? Yes. Like part of that strategy is like, well, how do you sell that house? Well, if you are with that buyer, you say, okay, well, what would you do to, to make it your own? And then you start to invite them into the designing process and that creativity can shine through. And I'll give you an example. One of my clients, she just uh, had her offer accepted on a house this past weekend. And we were in the middle of negotiating another offer beforehand that they had had open for two days because the sellers were out of the country. Well, we got one counter in two days and then nothing else. So we were at the very end of our offer process and this other house came available. So we were like, you know what? We're probably not going to get that house. Let's run to that one. And it wasn't, it was 10 years older. It showed almost brand new. And it was by client laughing because there was a coil ring in the stove. And she's like, stoves with coil rings? What do you mean? Yeah, but it was a lot cleaner than that 10 year newer stove that we just were putting an offer on somewhere else. And she said, well, the color could use some work. I said, yeah, you're right. It could. So the other one was so stark white that it felt barren and there were spots where they had patched the holes, but didn't actually do it well. So that whole house needed to be painted as well. Yeah. You know, so looking at the detail of what's going to be the best and what's going to show the best for the long period of time and making it their own can be a really good uh, objection handling and inviting them into that decision making process. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think, like you said, the worst renovations are the ones you're doing with selling in mind or like shortly before selling. You you want a house that either hasn't been renovated take, and has been taken care of or somebody has done renovations for themselves because mm-hmm. they're making more quality finishings or spending a little bit yes. more money. You know, if you're painting a house immediately before selling, you're probably not doing a great job. You're probably not buying expensive paint. You're probably picking something that you don't even like. You're picking something that's like, you're you're making some, you know, an assumption that the masses mm-hmm. will appreciate. Sure. Um, so yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. It's, it's um, visualization, but you need to, like, we all need help with that. And I think having that conversation can really put buyers in the house instead of like, oh yeah, it needs paint. Yeah, it needs paint. And then just add it to the list of, of things that need to be done. And then, yeah, yeah. You get, you don't get I find there's a, there's a list of three. Unless someone's looking for a project, yeah. you get three things they got to do in the house. If you yeah. bypass three options on the list of what needs work, it's not too much for them to do. Especially yeah. if it's at the height of their budget or if it's really uh, significant market conditions where they're going to have to maybe be in competing offers. Once you start adding in all those different pieces, they're like, it's just too much. It's not enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a good that's a good rule. So I think in in people's minds everything is ten thousand dollars new paint paint repaint a whole house ten grand new flooring ten grand like whatever ten grand and then all of a sudden it's like oh we need 30 extra thousand if we're gonna buy this house um yeah and sometimes especially as a listing agent you don't get to have that conversation you don't get to be the one to rationalize it you just you're showing Mm -hmm. and you're kind of at the mercy of of what they see yeah. So well, can't. and I feel like sometimes when we are in that position, whether it's a buyer's agent or an open house or even like a seller's agent, it's that that realistic approach of, well, hold on a second, come back down to earth. Yes. You know, let's talk <laughs> about this, you know, because people get crazy. And like the best point that you made about that is when someone has, does renovations for themselves. Yeah. That's the most important quality that I would look for. And when I talk to people that are doing renovations or when they're buying the house, 
I will tell them like, well, what is, what is your intention with that investment? Because prudent investment is important in all aspects of our lives. But if you're doing it for yourself, fine, do everything that you want to do, but just know that someone's not going to pay what you're going to ask for that material. If it's for your standard, if you're doing it just for the sake of doing that flip or doing whatever it's going to be find good quality, but don't go crazy. You know, if you do a a really expensive travertine tile, but it doesn't look very nice, well, then no one's, they're going to tear it right out. And then you lost your money. Exactly. Yes. And that's a good point too. Like if you are getting value out of it, like every day you wake up and you go into your kitchen and you're like, oh my gosh, I love what I did. Um, Then absolutely do whatever you want. But (laughs) uh, if you're not getting that value out of it, then yeah, just, yeah. Like you said, do good quality. Like, um, on the reverse side, if you don't, do, if you if you're doing it for yourself and you don't do what you want, you're gonna see it every day and go, oh, yeah. I wish I would have. Yes. And that's like the, the flip. It's like if you're, if you're gonna stay there in a long time, do what you want because you're gonna see it every day. Yeah. If you're gonna be moving out, do what's best for the general population. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, well, that's the end of our our episode. Thank you so much for joining me. That was a great discussion. Thanks um, for having me. Time flew by. It did. It did. Again, go follow Carlin. It's at Carlin the Realtor on Instagram and uh, follow, like, subscribe to the podcast to listen to more um, amazing open house stories from people like Carlin. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.